actually, because of some of the things that Lewis said in his introduction, I'm going to start out with a, um, a quote, which wasn't exactly the way I planned to start, but it's, it's stuck in my mind a lot. There is a historian of religion who just passed away this year. His name was Yaroslav Pelikan. I don't know if any of you have heard of him. He was, I think, the greatest historian of religion of the 20th century. And he wrote a book called The Uses of Tradition. And in this book, uh, he was discussing, it, it, it came out of a lot of the debates that occurred in the late 20th century about dead white European males and whether it was worthwhile to look back to the past and in what way and so forth. And in the course of this little book, which actually came out of a lecture series, he says, tradition is the living thought of dead people. Traditionalism is the dead thought of living people. <laughs> and I thought it was a really pithy way of capturing the difference between having a reverence for tradition and wanting it to be part of our lives and being a traditionalist, which is to go on in a, in a dead way, even though you're alive, and not continually create new things. Okay, so that, that's sort of coming off what Lewis had to say, and I thank you very much for that um, very flattering introduction. I'm always elated to be in Philadelphia. Uh, I think it's my favorite American city. I don't live here, so I don't know any of its flaws. But whenever I come, <laughs> I think of it as the cradle of the American Republic and also a city which has another layer of meaning for me since I became Catholic because it has such a rich Catholic cultural tradition. And I feel very honored to be speaking every time I come to Ivy Hall because I know that you are nurturing and fostering and reviving and pushing forward that tradition, and I like to think that I can be a small part of that. Um, when I was asked to speak on the Holy Family, uh, this was a little different from other things that I've spoken on here because I'd never done it before. I said yes. <laughs> I had to draw upon my background not only as an art historian but also as a journalist, uh, which is something I did for about 20 years. And you know, a journalist is often called upon, a good journalist, to go out and uh, in a matter of hours or days learn a lot about something you knew nothing about before and try to figure out what's important about it and present it to an audience and figure out who your audience is and, and, and present it to those people. So in the case of the Holy Family and the history of the Holy Family and how it's presented in art is something I had never thought about. And I invite you to accompany me tonight on my journey of discovery of this fascinating subject because it turned out to be quite different from other subjects that I've talked about here and in other places. Uh, first of all, because the subject of the Holy Family in art is not a very old one in Christian art compared to, for example, the Annunciation or the Crucifixion or other kinds of uh, uh, Christian subjects that go very, very far back in time. This one's not so old. And there's an aspect of it that one could almost describe as social anthropology. That is, the way in which the Holy Family is seen undoubtedly mirrors and expresses things that were going on in society with respect to families and how families were thought about over time. Uh, before I leave the subject of Yaroslav Pelikan, whom I of course never met, but uh, who came very dear to me as I read his books, uh, he also said uh, that as a child he always put the letters JMJ at the top of all of his school papers. Uh, and that really surprised me because he grew up Lutheran. And I thought that was a Catholic thing, right? Jesus, Mary, and Joseph, the invo invocation of the... He grew up Lutheran, and then in his old age, after he retired and became professor emeritus at the Yale Divinity School, he converted to the Greek Orthodox faith, which didn't really surprise me because I knew that it had to be either that or Catholicism because he had such a deep respect and love for the Blessed Virgin Mary. And those were the, the two churches that really that follow in that most closely. So we'll leave Yaroslav Pelikan for the moment. Uh, where was I? I was talking about the Holy Family and how it evolves. Okay, we're going to talk about the Holy Family. In um, 
few years ago, I heard a homily on the Holy Family in, in Northern Virginia, one of our very brilliant priests, who said, it must have been tough to be Joseph. Suppose an argument arises in the Holy Family. All families have arguments, right? Even perfect ones. Jesus is God. <laughs> Mary is without sin. <laughs> so what is Joseph? Joseph is always going to come out with a short straw, right? But you know, I've been thinking of really a lot about Joseph the last few days because you can't have the Holy Family without Joseph as part of it. And that's one reason that this subject evolves somewhat late, because the importance of Joseph is gradually recognized by the church. Joseph was a really good listener. In fact, we don't have a single word from him. He's not quoted once in the entire scriptural record. But he knew how to listen, and he knew how to act on what he heard. And this scene, we'll come back to it. Uh, this is a unique picture of... Uh, that I'll just talk about a little bit, a bit later on of the Holy Family, one that I don't think any other artist ever depicted. Now I'm going to start with, we're going to use a lot of scripture tonight as it turns out, because that was part of my journey. And by the way, since we are a relatively small group, if you have a question you're itching to ask while I've got something on the screen, just raise your hand. I think we can be that informal, okay? Um, I looked at the text that's used for Holy Family Sunday, which is this year's falling on December 31st um, uh, for the gospel reading for that day. So I'm going to start there. And it comes from the second chapter of Luke. Now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up according to custom. And when the feast was ended, as they were returning, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. Shades of home alone, right? We mm -hmm. they left, and he wasn't with them. Uh, this, by the way, this beautiful painting of Christ is uh, by a Venetian artist named Chima. His parents did not know it, but supposing to be him to be in the company, they were in a day, they went a day's journey and they sought him among their kinsfolk and acquaintances. We'll come back to that kinsfolk question later on. And when they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem seeking him. After three days, they found him in the temple among the teachers, listening to all and asking him questions, and all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. So here we have Mary and Joseph. This is an English painting from the 19th century by Holman Hunt, finding, of course, overjoyed to find their son after three days. And when they saw him, they were astonished, and his mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us so? Behold, your father and I have been looking for you anxiously. And he said to them, how is it that you sought me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? Well, look at this. Okay, Here's a painting by Simone Martini, who was one of the great masters of the early 14th century in Italy, man of, of international reputation. Very unusual to have a narrative painting of this sort. And perhaps it came from a larger ensemble that has now been lost. And here we see that Jesus, having been brought, born truly human, grew up to be truly adolescent, <laughs> right? If we did not know that this was the Son of God, we would swear that we were looking at a petulant and defiant teenager here. His arms are crossed, his lips are pouting a little bit, and he is saying, well, didn't you know where I was to be? And his mother is clearly quite serious. She has a book on her lap. Now, Mary is upset. Anyone here who is a parent can really understand why she would be upset. But you've got to add a dimension to that. The book on her lap reflects, it's probably the same book she has on her lap in many scenes of the Annunciation. It's the prophecy of Isaiah. So she knows that he is the Messiah, and she knows that terrible things are going to happen to the Messiah. And she also knows that she's been given an incredible trust and responsibility for this child, and she lost him. Okay, so we have a totally human situation here, a human family situation. And Joseph, as I think often tends to be the case in conflicts between a mother and a teenage son, Joseph is the father is mediating here and trying to make them both understand each other. Now, conflicts do arise in perfect families. That is the really interesting thing about this. The fact that all of these people were such models of righteousness didn't mean that there weren't going to be disputes or conflicts because they're in a human world and sometimes two people can each have 
very good and very honorable and correct aims, and those can be in conflict with one another. This, this picture is actually used by Sister Wendy in her book of Charles, Child Book of Prayer Through Art, and I think she uses it to illustrate the, the virtue of respect. And she says, when you need, when you have a conflict in a family, it's really important that everybody respects one another. So this is a, a kind of a special painting of the Holy Family because it's not saccharine, it's not glossed over, it's a real situation. It is a situation in which we have the Son of God reaching out for his destiny. But what is so wonderful about it is we also see him as a human 12-year-old boy. And a 12-year-old boy, as you should know if you've ever had one, is out there trying to establish his own identity and go out into the world and be his own self separate from his parents and his family. So that human dimension and the divine dimension are shown at the same time. And that's what we're really dealing with in the Holy Family. And they did not understand, continuing the scripture, they did not understand the saying which he spoke to them. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was obedient to them, and his mother kept all these things in her heart. And that is, again, truly amazing, okay? He wants to go out, he sees his destiny, and he's obedient to them. There are prayers to the Holy Family. Um, I think I brought one along with me here, in fact, someplace here. Jesus, our most loving Redeemer, you came to enlighten the world with your teaching and example. You willed to spend the greater part of your life in humble obedience to Mary and Joseph in the poor home of Nazareth. In this way, you sanctified that family, which was to be an example for all Christian families. Well, until I read that prayer, I, had, I don't ever remember reflecting on the path fact that of the 33 years that Christ was on earth, he spent 30 of them in this family being obedient to these human parents, which is quite an example and quite a model. Uh, this is an unusual painting. It's a 19th century painting by one of the pre-Raphael, Stante Gabriel Rossetti, and it shows the Holy Family observing Passover. And of course, they did, right? They were observant Jews, and they did all of the other things, but you don't very often see that uh, reflected. Who would that fourth character Oh, let's see. In that painting, is there a fourth person? Perhaps uh, a neighbor or a member of the extended family. We'll talk about the extended family further along. Interesting uh, question there. Yeah. Whoops. Didn't mean to do that. And Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. And here again, a somewhat unusual painting. This is by a French artist named Georges de la Tour, showing young Jesus in the carpenter shop. We know that he learned the trade of carpentry. It's referred to later on, but we don't very often see him actually learning this uh, with Joseph. Georges de la Tour is an artist who lived in the war tone area that we now call Alsace-Lorraine in the time of the, thir of the Thirty Years' War of the 17th century. Close up. Now, the changing Holy Family. This was my journey of discovery. When, when uh, Dr. John Haas first said to me, Holy Family, immediately I said, oh, sure. And I thought of the beautiful Raphael sort of photo op mm -hmm. uh, um, paintings with the, with the three members or sometimes with occasionally other people in the extended family. Uh, but I didn't realize how complicated this was actually going to turn out to be. Because the way that the Holy Family is seen changed quite radically over a series of centuries. Now we start here with Fra Angelico in the early Renaissance, uh, and we see the Holy Family in one of the scenes in which they're often portrayed, which is the flight into Egypt. Mary looks rather queenly and pristine and very lovely, uh, riding, it's even almost hard to see how she's balancing on that donkey. It's almost by divine power, you know, she's like, and then behind her is trudging along this older fellow with uh, carrying the baggage, so to speak. And he doesn't seem to be playing. He's, he's always a little bit distant and removed. He's not playing an integral role. He's part of the picture. He's important. Uh, uh, and he certainly has great dignity. He doesn't always in all of the paintings. He, does, he has great dignity. Sometimes in the paintings of this period, this is just a little bit earlier than Frangelico, and it's by a man named Bruderlam, 
who was working at the courts of the Dukes of Burgundy, a courtly artist, and he did a big altarpiece called the Dijon Altar in 1399, which has a number of these scenes from the infancy of Christ. We see here the presentation of the temple, and then over on the right side we have that flight into Egypt. And here there is an even greater contrast between the queenly virgin and a rather loutish Joseph. I feel like he really belongs to a different social class. And often in this period, Joseph is shown, first of all, as a much older man, and we'll get to that in a moment as to why there is that tradition, often as a much older man, and in this case, as a, a, almost, almost occasionally as a figure of ridicule, right? He's not important. Now, there was something of a theological reason for this. There was an interest in showing that the Virgin Mary was truly a virgin and was not, didn't really have anything physically to do with this man. And so they would show him as this older man. Here is a, a painting from the early 15th century by Campin, who was one of the pioneers of the Flemish school of, of oil painting that comes in in the early 15th century. And it's a marriage of the Virgin. And it's actually divided into two scenes. There's a kind of a synagogue scene over there on the left, and then a, a, what looks like a church more on the right, and you see the transition from the Old to the New Covenant. And the legend was that very many young men wanted to marry the Virgin Mary, but only Joseph, this older guy, uh, actually, uh, they all brought, uh, they had a stick and they brought it into the church, and his burst into blossom in that and so often when you see him with a rod in his hand that's flowering like a bunch of lilies or something like that, that refers to that legend. So over here, we have them actually being married. And you can see that um, Joseph is shown here as, a, as an older fellow. He, has, uh, um, uh, he needs dentures, right? His <laughs> mouth is kind of sunken in in this case. So uh, what, he, he has much more dignity here, but he's still shown as somebody who's old. Simultaneously, there is a, a great interest in the, the rest of the Holy Family, the extended Holy Family, especially St. Anne. And in uh, Germany and Austria, also in Italy, you will often see paintings in this period, they're called the Anna Selbdunit, and it's a huge St. Anne with a much smaller Mary on her lap and then the baby, you know, it's sort of like Chinese boxes. Way that that, that the, the Anna is, is very large. She's always dressed in green and red. Her name means grace in Hebrew. Here she's on the same scale, and this is by the master of Frankfurt, but he's probably not German. He's probably a Netherlandish artist working in the second half of the 15th century. And it shows the virgin and child with St. Anne. So this is a kind of holy family. This is a holy family of the matrilineal lineage, the grandmother the mother and the child. And here we see a double trinity, that the, the women and the child form the earthly part of the equation, and then down the center is the divine trinity, and of course Jesus belongs to both. The great interest in St. Anne had also to do with the rising interest in the doctrine of the Immaculate Conception, which we are celebrating today as the Feast of the Immaculate Conception. The logic was that if Mary was conceived immaculately, then St. Anne, her mother, must be a very, very special person, worthy of a great deal of veneration. And so there became an interest in this extended family, the, the, the mother and grandmother, and uh, that whole extended family of Jesus on that side. Now, this probably also corresponds to what social life might have been like in Europe at that time where extended families, in traditional cultures, extended families are very, very important. Uh, and I'm going to show you how far this went. The holy kinship. Now we do have a lot of, uh, quite a few altar pieces uh, all over Europe, but especially in, in Germany, uh, called the holy kinship. And this is based on a tradition which I think may come out of a book called the Proto-Evangelium of St. James, which had furnished a lot of details that are not in the Bible about the life of Jesus. They are not necessarily true. They're not necessarily untrue. They're not accepted as part of the canon of the scripture. But one uh, story here was that St. Anne, after the death of Joachim, married two more times and had two more daughters. And they had husbands. 
And this gave rise to a whole bunch of cousins. And that these may be the children who are sometimes referred to in the New Testament as the brothers and sisters of Jesus. Because the Hebrew words for cousins and brothers and sisters are, more, are, are pretty much equivalent. So here's one of these altarpieces in the early 16th century of the Holy Kinship. And in the very center of it is the Madonna and the child. Uh, here's St. Anne again, always dressed in red and green. Here's Joseph who's sleeping, who's often shown sleeping. Sometimes he's holding a book with his lineage from uh, the house of David. And all of these other children uh, appear in here. Some of them later became apostles according to this idea that they were, that they were uh, related to Jesus. Yes. Uh, in dealing with this extended family kinship, now that's a German concept. Yeah. And this is 15th century. Right. How does this relate at all to the Reformation? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if it, uh, it doesn't seem to me that it particularly, now Cronach is somebody who happened to, became a follower of Luther. But these pictures of the Holy Kinship go back to before the Reformation. And I'm not really sure. Uh, I mean, the, the, uh, the Luther, of course, was quite friendly to the idea of images. Calvin, when he came along, was very unfriendly to the idea of images. Uh, so all of this kind of thing went by the way. Right? One thing that begins to happen with the Protestant Reformation, and it actually is um, I, I think it became a boon to the Catholic idea of the, of the Holy Family, is that there is a movement to go back to the Bible. And of course, these things are not in the Bible. Right? These are traditions that are not in Scripture. So this all starts to kind of die down, uh, the holy kinship and stuff. We don't see much of it after, say, the middle of the 16th century. Uh, this really extended family, especially the idea of the family of St. Anne, I don't know if that answers your question, but the fact is I don't really, that's, that's a really interesting question and I don't know all the implications of it. But also, Luther didn't deny the perpetual virginity of Mary. So he no. Would have, he wouldn't have, have uh, even thought to question the fact that the brothers and sisters of Jesus were part of this extended family. This extended family, family, right. Yeah. If you think about, I mean, I, I found it really interesting to study that scripture, that, that, that's the Holy Family scripture, about how they, they were traveling with this big bunch of kinfolk and acquaintances, the whole village. And, you know, it, in rural villages, everybody is generally related. <laughs> uh, or, you know, a lot, half of the people are your relatives. That's true in the little town that I came from. Even, you know, a generation or two ago, it's not very often true today. Uh, so, although it was embellished by the imagination of people, you know, making up uh, Mary Salome and Mary Cleophas and so on, that was one way they accounted for the Marys at the tomb. These were aunts, basically, right? These were half-sisters of Mary. And I don't think there's any solid basis for believing that's true, but there was, a, there was a deeper reality underneath that, which is that Jesus came from a clan. Uh, we don't know how exactly it worked, but there was certainly a clan. Otherwise, they were traveling with that clan. That's why they didn't miss Jesus when they were two days out from, uh, from Jerusalem. Okay, let's go forward here. Now, Robert Campin, the same artist that we saw a couple of minutes ago in the marriage of the Virgin, was indicating that the, that the, uh, the sunken teeth of, of Joseph and that, and that he appears to be uh, not the most dignified figure in the world, He's also the author of this famous Meroda altarpiece, which is in the Cloisters Museum in New York. And this is an altarpiece of the Annunciation. And for the first time, well, there are many things that happen for the first time. It's very early, 16, about 14, 1425. Uh, for the first time, the Annunciation is shown in a domestic interior. Kind of a well, well off domestic interior of a middle class household in the Netherlands. But moreover, what really interests us here, and there's all of these uh, wonderful hidden symbolism uh, that was typical of the painting of this time, where everything that you see in the painting has a, has a symbolic religious meaning. Uh, but in addition to that, what really interests us here is the wings of this altarpiece. Now, the wings are parts that would perhaps be folded closed on, on uh, uh, days that, weekdays, right? So, but, but when it's opened up, we see in the wings, on the left hand, the patron, 
the, uh, the, the supplicant, the man who paid for the painting and appears uh, in worship. Uh, and on the other hand, we see Joseph. And Joseph here has been invested with a dignity and importance that we have never seen before in quite this way in painting. Not simply that he's given dignity, but he's actually given a role. He is a carpenter. What is he building? Well, this is a matter of great debate, but the most uh, popular scholarly analysis of this painting says he's building mouse traps. And he has one out on his shelf there, which he's selling to the town. Uh, why would he be building mouse traps? Because St. Augustine talked about the mouse trap for the devil, that Jesus was the mouse trap for the devil. <laughs> And so if you know this, the, these, all of these writings and so on, you begin to be able to read into the painting the, uh, the meanings, the hidden meanings of the thing. And in fact, that St. Joseph was there to kind of fool the devil. I'm sure the devil wasn't fooled, but it made it appear that he did have an earthly father who was this carpenter. This painting has been linked to a movement called uh, the Devotio Moderna, or the Brotherhood of the Common Life, which was one of many religious movements that was around in the 15th century that was fostering the idea of a direct relationship to Jesus, an imitation of the life of Jesus Christ. And they worked generally among the lower classes of society. So uh, one shouldn't overstate their relationship to a painting like this because anyone who could buy a painting like this and was probably quite rich and not in the lowest ranks of society. But the Brotherhood of the Common Life had a very, very strong advocacy of Joseph, St. Joseph. And this is the first time in history we begin to see societies of St. Joseph and confraternities of St. Joseph. And people actually uh, elevating him to a really important role and saying he should be imitated. And that's not surprising because we have the, the rise of towns and we have guilds and we have craftspeople and we have... Uh, you know, we long, no longer have just the three estates, right? We don't just have the soldiery and the clergy and the peasants, but we have these townspeople, and he is the perfect saint for the townsman, the hardworking provider uh, and, and the skilled craftsman. So even though he's still an old man, we see him in a new way here. 16th century, Lorenzo Lotto, a fascinating Italian painter of the Renaissance. And this is a little nativity down in the National Gallery in Washington. And Lotto was also very much associated with this rise in interest in St. Joseph. And he actually puts St. Joseph in prominent places in some of his other paintings where we have never seen Joseph before. This is a good example. Uh, for one thing, this is an, a nativity in which there's nobody else on hand. If you don't count the angels, there are no shepherds, there are no wise men. There are no midwives. There are none of the usual cast of characters that one would often see in a nativity scene. It is simply the Madonna and Joseph pretty much on an equal plane adoring the Christ child. And that is extraordinary. That's new to give Joseph that role. And in addition, we can see that Joseph is already doing some of the things. He's packed. He's ready for the journey. Right? He's already, he's the provider uh, over here, someone has finally figured out, this is, these two pieces of wood are where Lotto put his signature, and uh, they seem to be two pieces of wood that have been cut by a carpenter, prepared to be joined together, and they would be joined in the shape of a cross. So he's very involved in his child's future. Uh, and like any good Christian family, they have a crucifix on the wall <laughs> of this table, a little bit ahead of things there. <laughs> <laughs> But it's undoubtedly a symbolic reference to all of these things. So he's ready to provide for his family to protect them. Um, Raphael in 1504, also the High Renaissance, Lotto belongs to that same period. Uh, Raphael shows the marriage of the Virgin, and this beautiful painting is justly very, very famous. Uh, they stand before a church, which is evocative of the architecture of the new St. Peter's that was being built at this very time. And, and Mary is associated with it mystically with being the church. But the point that I wanted to make here is that we do not have an old Joseph meeting dentures. We have a vigorous man in the prime of life, uh, worthy really truly to be the husband of this beautiful young woman. So this is, this is a real uh, change. We're beginning to see this shift in the way that he is seen. And in fact, the Council of Trent, the Council of Trent in the middle of the 16th century, the Catholic Church 
uh, dismissed all of these ideas that Joseph was some old cadger who had been pulled into duty. Uh, and, and they show him as a vigorous man in the prime of life uh, who is uh, really uh, has the strength uh, uh, to be the kind of person, the courageous person that we see him to be in scripture. So I just pulled together from different countries from the 17th century. On the right is Caravaggio, a not very well-known uh, painting by him. Of course, he's one of the founding fathers of 17th century painting. And you see this... Uh, Joseph is a man of, you know, perhaps 40 or so, but very vigorous. And on the left, Everdingen, Dutch painter you've probably never heard of, but he's a painter who was painting for the clandestine Dutch Catholic churches that were in the lofts of the uh, private homes during the period when the Dutch weren't allowed to have mass in their houses in the public. Uh, here's a French and a Spanish example. On the left is the Spanish uh, uh, painter Murillo, who uh, uh, was a very sweet painter, sometimes a little too sweet, but, but often a very touching painter. Here he shows Joseph as a nurturing father, uh, someone who is not asleep off at the side, but who is directly involved. Here he's uh, giving the child back to his mother while he goes back to his carpentry work in the background. And finally, the Frenchman, the uh, neo, sort of classical uh, Frenchman Philippe de Champagne, same period, middle of the 17th century, and we see the presentation in the temple, and we're going to see this painting again later on, but here I just wanted to point out the kind of Joseph, this vigorous young man. He's losing a bit of his hair, but he's certainly in the prime of life. Now, there is an extraordinary similarity between uh, many of the Protestant and Catholic renditions of the Holy Family in this period. That I found kind of striking. Rembrandt on the left, around 1635. And again, we also see here this very involved Joseph. Mary has just finished nursing the Christ child and he's falling asleep. And Joseph, with his tools in the background, is hovering over the family in this protective way. Or on the right, Giuseppe Maria Crespi, how many of you have ever heard of Giuseppe Maria Cresti? Oh, good. <laughs> so I'm going to introduce you to somebody new. Uh, he's an artist who worked in the late 17th and 18th century. He's kind of the Italian Rembrandt in many ways. And uh, this painting is probably 100 years after Rembrandt's painting, but it's very similar. And here we see Joseph as a book. And often in the Italian paintings, we see him as a book with a book because he takes on this role of being the teacher of the Christ child. Okay, now, the Holy Family of Scripture. So I started going through. Now, if you've ever compared the Gospel of Matthew and the Gospel of Luke, the nativity, uh, the stories of the infancy of Christ, you find that they're not so easy to reconcile. <laughs> Quite difficult. And this formed a rather interesting challenge for artists. Um, so, now, I haven't given all the references here, but I do know where they come. This is from Matthew. The dream of Joseph. The angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, descendant of David, do not be afraid to take Mary to be your wife, for it is by the Holy Spirit that she has conceived. She will have a son and will name him Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. And Philippe de Champagne, this ingenious French painter, has portrayed this picture. He has managed to sort of, by implication, combine the account in Luke of the Annunciation to Mary with the Annunciation. Just because Mary in the background has just gotten the message, or so we believe, and the and the angel is flying right over to Joseph, who's having a, who's asleep, as it often is in these things, and bringing him up to date on what is going on. And I think it's just done beautifully. I mean, it's just completely plausible, and 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 so we can kind of put these two stories, which which otherwise seem a little bit contradictory as to how the word was gotten out, and, and Mary is in that pose that we often see her with the book and the lectern, and she's watching the angel as he leaves. She's received the Annunciation, and he goes to Joseph. So this is the, uh, an artist who has managed to combine these two ideas very beautifully. So when Joseph woke up, he married Mary, as the angel of the Lord had told him to, but he had no sexual relationships with her before she gave birth to her son. Matthew 1, 24, 25. And here we have Murillo again, and the Holy Spirit is blessing this union of 
of Mary and Joseph, and each of them had been told in their separate enunciation that the Holy Spirit was the source of was uh, was the source of the child. The visitation. Okay, now this was something new that I learned while I was doing this. Usually, if you see a picture of the visitation in the Renaissance or in the Gothic cathedrals or whatever, there's two people in it: Mary and her elderly cousin Elizabeth, the mother of St. John the Baptist. That is the way that it is always rendered. And then sometimes there's an extra, you know, servant here, and dog, and other things that are put in it to embellish a few angels standing around. But those are the two characters, and sometimes we have only those two. But starting in the late 16th century, and I don't know who is the first. I did find one painting that was probably 1590 or so. I don't know if there are any older versions. The following logic was applied. A, a young woman of Mary's age would not have journeyed by herself to a far distant country to visit her cousin. It was not done. It would not have been done. Joseph must have been with her. And so we began to see Joseph appearing in these scenes of the visitation and indeed, since Joseph is there, we know that Elizabeth's husband, Zachariah, is right there because it's her, his home. So, now here's the scripture. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby moved within her. Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit and said in a loud voice, You are the most blessed of all women, and blessed is the child you will bear, as related in Luke. So Rubens, in his great altarpiece of the descent from the cross, of which this is one of the wings, in the, uh, the, the early 17th century has portrayed this scene. I'm going to give you a close-up. Mary and Elizabeth in the foreground, Zachariah and Joseph embracing and greeting each other in the background. So we have a whole family here, the extended family. Uh, not only that, but sometimes, I just love these, but especially the one over there on the left, uh, that's by Gaetano Gandolfi, who's a great Roman painter who lived in the uh, overlap the time of the French Revolution, very late. Uh, and up here is Philippe de Champagne, who has <laughs> put his figures in courtly French dress in the 17th century. But look at Gandolfi's uh, edition, because some of these stories that this is described is that Joseph had gotten the dream, and he knew what the score was. He had been told by the angel, but he didn't totally get it. And at the moment of the embrace, at the moment when Elizabeth says, who am I that the, my mother of my Lord should come to be? He gets it. Okay? And so there you have Joseph going like this, because he's getting it, right? He really, now he really understands. He's been told by the angel, but now he really understands. So in this case, unlike the Rubens where we had the women in the foreground and the men right behind them, here we have a kind of crisscross of the two women embracing and then as, as a kind of expat with Zachariah and Joseph heading towards his usher as they also mutually understand this wonderful miracle. Up here as well, uh, in the Chiquette de Champagne, the two ladies, very elegantly dressed, uh, are, are embracing. Joseph is coming with the donkey, and he is uh, about to say hello to this uh, country gentleman here who is Zacharias. <laughs> so every culture would translate these stories into their, into, their own, uh, into their own idiom, but the important thing is that the visitation now becomes part of the way of seeing the Holy Family. Um, okay, all of the Holy Family is present here. Uh, Joseph, this is an early painting of French anonymous late 15th century, very unusual. You don't often see paintings of the pregnant uh, Virgin Mary, um, but here we do. And here it's uh, still in the period when Joseph was shown as a very, very elderly man, but he's watchfully uh, standing behind Mary as she's awaiting her uh, the birth. Joseph went to register to, for his taxes with Mary, who was promised in marriage to him she was pregnant. And while they were in Bethlehem, the time came for her to have her baby, according to the Gospel of Luke. Oops, went the wrong way here. She gave birth to her first son, wrapped him in cloths, laid him in a manger. There was no room for them to stay in the inn, the famous nativity of Jesus. This is Giotto from the uh, Arena Chapel, famous frescoes of the early 14th century. 
And Giotto is the master of human, showing human relations in a very simple and straightforward way. We see, for example, uh, the central focus of the painting is the way in which Mary tenderly and somewhat sadly looks at her son as she puts him in the manger, almost as if she is relinquishing him and she doesn't want to do this. Uh, so it's a very human kind of gesture, and here's the additional weight upon her that she will have to relinquish her son for her, his sacrifice. Joseph is asleep. Now, sometimes this is said, well, Joseph, he's shown to be asleep. He's peripheral. I think, after having studied a lot of these pictures, that he's shown asleep in a painting like this because he's having his dream. Okay, mm -hmm. that, that there's a double meaning here. Uh, you know, they don't clutter up the painting with a lot of additional angels, but in fact... We know that his role is to have these dreams, to listen and act upon them. Uh, so the angels are making the announcement uh, to the shepherds, and meanwhile, maybe they are also giving a me message to Joseph. So they hurried he wrote, off. Yeah? He, he wrote, she gave birth to her first son. Yeah, that's what it her says. Of, what Bible? I mean, that is the... Usually it says firstborn son in most of the version, but this just says her first son. Apparently, the literary translation. It's not to imply that there's a second. Right. right. <laughs> it doesn't imply that there's a second, but it's her first. Because no, I know it does. But, yeah. but I always thought if it's a Catholic Bible, I would have, would have always thought that they wouldn't have said that. They did. Yeah. This is the St. Joseph Catholic Study Bible. That's where I took it out of. I mean, I'm married to my first wife. <laughs> for, 40, for 40 years now. <laughs> I know, if I would have said that to my wife. That struck me too when I saw it because I, I'm sort of used to some of the older translations. I usually say her firstborn son. Well, really, firstborn and first is the same thing. You know, we're just more used to the firstborn, and this kind of strikes us in a way. But that, that's what I took it from. So they hurried off, the shepherds were still with the shepherds, found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in the manger. When the shepherds saw him, they, they told them what the angel had said about the child. All who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said. Implication that even the Holy Family is amazed at what the shepherds said. It's kind of interesting. I never really noticed that before. Anyway. Mary remembered all these things and thought deeply about them. The shepherds went back singing praises to God for all they had heard and seen. It had been just as the angel had told them. This painting by Hugo van der Hoes in 1477, I think it's been the topic of some lectures here at Ivy Hall. Not by me, but, uh, and unfortunately, I'm sorry, I put that lettering right over St. Joseph so you can't see what a great dignified, large figure he is there with his hands, his rather rough hands uh, clasped in prayer. Uh, my father, who passed away last year at the age of 89, was a man who had done a lot of manual labor in his life and was very proud of it. As a, as a teenager, he had run a farm, and then he worked in a gravel pit, and he did all of these other things. And he had said as a child he was envious of his grandfather because he had these hands that were hardened by hard work. Uh, now, by the time my dad got to be 89, his hands were soft. He felt bad about that. <laughs> uh, you, know, to, to, that, that you, know, you almost forget, because we're all here on computers and so on, that idea of the, of the hands. Uh, but in an artist like Hugo Vanderhost, I think the hands of St. Joseph are quite striking in this picture, and I'm sorry I've somewhat obscured them with the, the lettering there. They are the hands of a man who works with his hands. And we, we feel that as we, as we, as we look at, the, at a painting like this. Okay, circumcision. Now, when the time came for the baby to be circumcised, he was made G Jesus, the name which the angel had given him before he had been conceived. This is by Baron Fabritius, a follower of Rembrandt, 17th century Dutch painting. And uh, I am assuming, in looking at this painting, that this is Joseph and this is Mary which is a, a sort of different in the order in which they would use it. But that would make sense because the circumcision would be the Jewish ceremony at which the child receives his name. And the father would be the one who gives the name to the child. Um, so Joseph is in the foreground here. 
In this painting, Italian painting by Bellini, and the Matthew text says, and Joseph named him Jesus. And this is one way in which the two Gospels are a little bit disparate. Okay, but of course, also the angel told Matthew, uh, Joseph who to, who, uh, how to name the child. And here we see Mary holding Jesus, but Joseph in a very intimate relay, I assume that's Joseph right there in the center, very, very close to the child at this moment of the circumcision, which we celebrate on um, January 4, the Feast of the Holy Name, right? Is that right? The Feast of the Holy Name. Uh, by the way, oh, let me just have little parentheses here. We've just entered today the greatest Marian season of the year for Catholics. We have the Feast of the Immaculate Conception today, in a few days, the Virgin of Guadalupe. Then we have through Advent in the readings, it varies from year to year, and so I don't know what they are this year, but we, either the Annunciation or the Visitation is usually in one of the Sunday readings. Then we have Christmas. Mary's really important for that. Uh, the Feast of the Holy Family on the 31st, the Mary Mother of God on the 1st of January, the, the, the Holy Name on January, is now it's usually celebrated on January 4th, which is the circumcision. January 6th, the, uh, officially, the changes from year to year in the calendar, in the church calendar, is Epiphany. Now traditionally, three different manifestations of God were celebrated on Epiphany, which were the adoration of the Magi, the baptism of Christ, and the wedding feast at Cana, all on the same day. And if you know that old hymn, um, Songs of Thankfulness and Praise, Jesus Christ to Thee We Raise, in that hymn, they actually talk about all three events, the, the, the Magi coming, the, uh, the baptism, and manifest in Jordan's bank, manifest at Cana, right, that those three things were together. All different man epiphanies or manifestations of God uh, with us. Then this season culminates in, on February 2nd with the presentation in the, in the temple. And that's the end of Christmas if you want to be really traditional about it. It's a long period. Okay, there we are, February 2nd. The time came for Joseph and Mary to perform the ceremony of purification as the law of Moses required. So they took the child to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. This is in Luke, the second chapter. And here is a painting by Giotto of around 1340. Uh, I singled some of these paintings to Ijado out because I was really struck by the extraordinary dignity and importance of Joseph in these paintings. Uh, and also this humanity that we always see. The babe is in Simeon's arms, but he's reaching back for mom. <laughs> and that is really typical of the way an infant, you know, when it comes to recognize his mother, uh, will act. And Joseph right behind her. Uh, and here's Who are those other characters? Oh, these are all, these are the main cast of characters here in this painting. Saint, uh, um, Anna, the old prophetess, who was in the temple at the same time, and so she has her prophecy, her scroll in her hands. Simeon, who is an old man, takes the child in his hands and says, Now let us thou thy servant depart in peace, for I've seen the salvation of Israel. And then Mary. So this is, this is limited to just the very, very simple basic um, cast. And there's no extra characters there. Um, Fra Angelico, similar, although here Fra Angelico, as he often does, he's added a modern spectator into it. He's put a Dominican nun in the picture who doesn't really belong there historically. Unless he means for that to be Anna. Perhaps he does. When the parents brought the child Jesus into the temple to do for him what the law required, Simeon took the child in his arms and blessed him and gave thanks to God. And there's Joseph in the background, and here we see Joseph again. They also went to offer the sacrifice of a pair of doves or two young pigeons, and is written in the law of the Lord. You see that very clearly with Joseph on the left in the Philippe de Champagne, picture of around 1650. Simeon said to Mary, his mother, this child is chosen by God for the destruction and salvation of many in Israel. Father Mark, can you go back to two slides? Mm-hmm. Now that, uh, could you mention something about the perspective? Oh, yes. Well, uh, this is from the early 15th century, about the time that the Florentines got really interested in scientific perspective. And so it's shown in a modern Renaissance church, churches that had hardly even been built at the time that this was painted, which is beginning to be built by architects like Brunelleschi. And it creates a beautiful and deep setting for this sacred act. And it's interesting, since you mentioned it, if we go back one more, 
to Giotto. Giotto tells the story only in terms of the human figures. The architectural setting is more symbolic than anything else. It, it has a certain, it's a, it's a ciborium or an altar canopy with an altar, with a lovely altar cloth on it, and that's all that really matters, and a kind of a nice tiled floor. The background is gold, so it suggests eternity. You know, this is taking place outside of time and space. And the architectural elements in it are simply there to suggest the setting in the way that you might do a very simple stage setting for a play. Just enough, just enough props to let you know where you are and what's happening, but not to really convince you. In the case of Frangelico, this is a period in which it was believed that it was very important to create beautiful settings in which conspicuous acts of virtue would be carried out, and that that would be the best way to train the next generation of young people for to live virtuous lives. And, uh, the, the, and so we have the same kind of... The composition is not that different, really, from the one we saw in Giotto, but all of a sudden it is put into this beautiful setting. Uh, a, a space has been created around it. It's still not a space we could still say you could quibble with it. You could say the figures are a little bit large, you know, for the, for the space that they're in. But there's no doubt about the fact that we have the sense that the, that the picture plane has been punctured and we're going deep. We have the illusion of a deep space being created around them. And of what looks like a classical temple, um, the French are always very concerned with uh, taste, so the colors have to be very chic, <laughs> beautiful. Color. The Adoration of the Magi. Uh, okay, so I'm skipping some things. I'm just going to those parts that directly deal with the Holy Family. We know that the three wise men are journeying. They're following a star. They stop and see Herod. That was a mistake. Uh, <laughs> but they didn't know it. They said, we're looking for the king of Israel. And then they, they come on. They follow the star to Bethlehem. We see the little star right there on the hill. The shepherds are in the background getting their announcements, so it's actually combining two scenes. The three magi come, the three wise men come to the house. They saw the child with his mother Mary. They knelt down and worshipped him. They brought out their gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh and presented them to him. And this is, again, Giotto's talent for making the scene uh, humanly believable. We're talking about 1340. Renaissance perspective hasn't been invented. This is, this is the pioneering kind of movie. What, what Giotto does is he gives the figures so much weight and volume and so much expressiveness that we believe them despite the fact that the space that they're existing in is still kind of a dollhouse space. So for example here, what I think is, is really moving at this painting, every time I look at it, I'm very touched by it, is the three magi as human beings. It's, it's almost like three faces of the same person. One is in profile, one is turned kind of three-quarter towards us, and one is in what's called lost profile. We can barely see the features of his face as he turns the other way. So we have this kind of ballet of turning to this, then this, then this. Okay, so we are actually, our, our minds, our feelings are led through to the Christ child, and the old king very tenderly picks up this little baby who's all wrapped up in the swaddling clothes. And as he does so, Joseph leans forward and takes the gift. So he's now the custodian of the family fortunes, the provider, right? He's, he's, you can read a lot of things into his gesture. He's making sure that the baby doesn't get dropped. He's watching over everything. He's a strong figure. He's not some old geezer about to lose his teeth. Not that I have anything against old geezers about to lose their teeth since I'm about to become one. But, <laughs> but he is a very uh, robust uh, figure here and is so involved. And his body language, so to speak, is kind of like an answer to that of the three kings. And then, of course, Mary kind of looking tenderly on at the whole thing. What's the significance of the gold? Is that a halo or a gold thing behind Mary's? And That's her halo. Those are halos. And Joseph, too, mm -hmm. had one? Joseph has a halo, and the Christ child has a halo. Interestingly, the three kings haven't gotten any halos yet. <laughs> okay? They're just, they're just there. Uh, after they had left, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph and said, Herod will be looking for 
the child in order to kill him. So get up, take the child and his mother, and escape to e Egypt and stay there until I tell you to leave. This is a tondo, a round painting, rather large, in the National Gallery in Washington by a Renaissance artist, a contemporary of Leonardo da Vinci named Piero di Cosimo. And it is not exactly a strictly narrative scene because we see the Virgin and an angel adoring the Christ child who has his uh, head on a sheaf of wheat, that undoubtedly a Eucharistic reference, and the little St. John the Baptist, his young cousin, is creeping up behind with a, with a reed cross. Um, uh, and so it, it's partly narrative and partly not narrative, uh, but I want to show you this detail because in the background, Joseph is having his dream, and he's coming down. He's quite old, but he's making his way down the stairs to let everybody know that it's time to pack up and leave. The flight into Egypt, I'm going to go through these quickly, a very popular subject, and there are many ways of conceiving this. Giotto, again, this figure of great strength and dignity of Joseph leading the family caravan uh, with the angel indicating the way to Egypt, 1307. End of the century, delicate uh, international Gothic style by Lorenzo Monaco with these jewel-like colors. And again, a very powerful Joseph as he turns around uh, with great concern towards his family. By no means uh, a buffoon-like character here. Um, I love this one. I don't know very much about it. She's got her travel hat on. As you, as you know, she's, and you'll see that quite often. The, tra the family has got their travel clothes. Um, of course, then there's this charming idea of the rest on the flight into Egypt. Now, we can be pretty sure it didn't happen this way. And of course, the landscape of the Sinai Desert looks nothing like this. But it was a beloved subject for artists and a way of showing the Holy Family. Uh, in the foreground, the Christ child is eating grapes, which is a reference to the wine of the Eucharist. In the background, Joseph is knocking down chestnuts from a tree to provide for his family. Some have suggested he's practicing his golf swing, <laughs> showing that that's a venerable sport, but I don't think so. Uh, later on, end of the 16th century, this young genius Caravaggio, one of the paintings that made his name for him, shows the rest of the flight. The interesting role for Joseph is the music stand here. Mm -hmm. An angel has dropped in playing a violin and is lullabying the Holy Family to sleep and this beautiful little vignette of the Madonna sleeping with the child in her arms. And Joseph, uh, uh, older but by no means decrepit, uh, in this role as the, as the, as the provider of the Holy Family. This one, I think, comes closer psychologically to what the flight of Egypt must have really been like. Terrifying. Absolutely terrifying. Journeying by night, hiding by day. Imagine yourself trying to get away from an oppressive regime. One can think of many situations in today's world in which, in which the actual situation of the Holy Family might apply. Adam Elsheimer, who was very much influenced by Caravaggio, a German painter of the early 17th century, often painting tiny paintings on copper, and this is one of his night scenes of the flight into Egypt. And then as time went on, some of the legendary stuff began to creep back in. This is my friend Giuseppe Maria Crespi, again, 18th century artist. The Holy Family on its flight into Egypt assaulted by a band of brigands. And this was quite a popular legend. They managed to convert the brigands, who then took them in and, and uh, gave them shelter and helped them out. And the little angels up there were probably of some assistance. Another dream. After Herod had died, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, get up, take the child and his mother, go back to the land of Israel, because those who tried to kill the child are dead. Georges de la Tour. And so we have a few paintings of the return from Egypt, and we can basically tell that that's what it is because the child is now walking. Um, I'm not going to read this text because you can read it for yourself. They go back and settle in Nazareth. Now this artist, a Netherlandish artist of the 15th century, seems to think they set up a rather nice house in Nazareth, which I think is probably not the case. Later on, later on, it's interpreted differently, but it's a lovely painting of the Virgin teaching the little Christ child to read and Joseph doing some uh, chore or other coming in in the background. Now, the hidden years. All those years from 
you know, being a toddler and coming back from uh, Egypt to the time he's 30 years old, maybe not nothing in particular, except he was strong, he was full of wisdom, he was blessed by God. Uh, St. Teresa of Avila was greatly devoted to St. Joseph. And in the 16th century, she really greatly changed things uh, by, by fostering the cult of St. Joseph. Uh, and so we see for the first time, in this case, El Greco, for example, actually paints an altarpiece in which St. Joseph is the center of the altarpiece. And the Christ child, as a young boy, dressed in a bright red robe, which is symbolic of the passion, is with his father. Okay, now, the Holy Family of Imagination. Well, we've had a little imagination up to now. We're not going to have lots more. But just sort of expand on all those years he was in, at, at, as, in Nazareth, obeying his parents. Here he is in a fresco in the Cathedral of Crema, a town in northern Italy. Joseph is using a plane, and he's creating a lot of wood shavings. Mary is sewing, and Jesus is sweeping up the wood shavings. This painting is now a little more serious vein, shows teenage uh, Joseph helping his mother with his sewing and pricking his finger and drawing blood. And of course, she has some premonition of the coming suffering of her son. This is by Zerberon, one of the great religious painters of 17th century Spain. There are just some other scenes. And the one on the left, Bernard Strigel, who also paints many paintings of the Holy Kinship. Joseph is creating lots and lots of wood shavings, but here the baby Jesus isn't old enough to sweep them up. And the right, the family at their meal. Now, we shouldn't just think of these as charming paintings of domestic life. They often have, especially in the 15th century, hidden symbolic meanings. Murillo, uh, the painting the creating the scene of the humble carpenter's family. Here we have the Christ child playing with the little St. John the Baptist. And now we have the nurturing Joseph. Mary's busy with her spinning in the background and uh, elaborate cloth we weaving uh, a yard winder, a yarn winder, a yarn winder. Uh, and, and the Christ child is playing with a bird and a puppy. And St. Joseph is overseeing that. And then we have paintings sometimes that bring together the holy kinship, but in a more modern way. This is the whole family of uh, the ones that we know of. It's Mary, the Christ child. Over there is Zacharias and Elizabeth and little St. John the Baptist, their son. And on this side will be Joachim and Anna. And the Christ child has unfolded the phylacteries, which are the Jewish... Um, scripture of things that they actually wear and he's unfolded the one from the St. John the Baptist and he's reading the prophecy of his own forthcoming death in this around 1735-1740 the holy family of doctrine Okay. now we also have the holy family very much removed from this anecdotal uh, kind of environment and this is much more in the context of the 17th century Catholicism 17th and 18th century Crespi, as a young artist, did this one on the left. And often there's a pairing of the divine trinity, the spiritual and eternal trinity, with this kind of earthly trinity of the holy family, as we see over there. And on the right is a, a, a version of this by Murillo, uh, another one by the Dutch painter De Witte. It's always basically the same idea. In the early 16th century, Raphael painted many paintings of the holy family, or the extended holy family. In this case, St. Joseph, again at the top, kind of in a protective way, some angels who are crowning Mary with roses, and St. Elizabeth who brings, who guides the little St. John the Baptist to fold his hands in prayers, just as you see parents guiding their young children to fold their hands in prayer in church. It's like the same kind of thing. So it has that kind of domestic charm to it. But certainly there are many doctrinal overtones to this. The crowning of Mary with the crown of roses suggesting that she is both queen and virgin and mother, all of those things at the same time. Uh, and the, the uh, 
Christ child embracing his mother, uh, but the cross directly behind him. Or this one, the great Kanijani Madonna by Raphael. Uh, uh, the famous Renaissance pyramidal scheme with Joseph as the protector of the Holy Family at the top, and Mary and Elizabeth with their two sons. It's almost as if we're revisiting the visitation a year or so after the birth of the children. And, and the, the, two, the divine child and the human child encountering one another. Uh, the end of the Holy Family. Well, we can infer from Scripture that Joseph died before Christ entered his earthly ministry. Because had he still been alive, we would not have seen Mary as a widow at the foot of the cross. We don't hear from him again. And so Catholic piety in the 17th and 18th century began to develop the idea of the death of Joseph with his family uh, surrounding him, and a young, uh, Jesus now is a young man. This is the most famous painting of this scene by Crispy again, of the, uh, uh, the 18th century painting now in Leningrad. And I believe, if I'm understanding the painting correctly, there's a couple of versions of this, that the angel behind the head of Joseph is actually administering the, la the anointing of the, the last... Uh, uh, Jesus does not administer the sacrament. Jesus is there comforting his father, but that there is a sacrament going on. Uh, and then this one is a 19th century painting, which is in the Holy House at Loreto. Uh, I don't remember the name of the artist, but uh, it, it's saying Jesus has appeared and saying goodbye to Joseph, and Joseph, the angels are preparing to, to um, uh, receive his soul into heaven now. Uh, I want to ask you, I wanted to show you really quickly the other thing that I have here, which is Gaudi. But I don't have to. <laughs> and just a question of whether we want to stop here or go on for 10 more minutes. Should we go on or should we stop? How many people would like to go on for 10 more minutes and see this, this architecture? We saw this. Oh, okay. Okay, just, just quickly. I, I, you know, this is a whole lecture in its own right, okay? Now, what I'm going to tell you, Antonio Gaudí, Catalan architect, he was born in um, Tarragona in Catalonia. And you know, if you know anything about Spain, Spain until recently was a bunch of different countries of which Catalonia is a very proud, independent one with its own language and its own culture. Uh, he, was, he had room, acute rheumatism as a child. He was in terrible pain. Uh, he was uh, rarely able to walk on foot. He was forced to ride a donkey. He remained close to home. Uh, and he became very involved in, <coughs> in studying nature uh, as a child. And he became an architecture student. And he, um, he joined a, a confraternity of St. Joseph, which he was involved with for all of his life. And they're the ones who decided to build this church, which is called the Expiatory Temple of the Holy Family, the Sagrada Familia. Uh, it is not the cathedral of Barcelona. There is a cathedral. So one tends to look at it and say cathedral because it looks like one. Uh, and he began the, this was begun in the 1880s. He was not the first architect. It was begun in the neo-Gothic style, and then he took it over, and it became his life's work. By the teens of the 20th century, he really had nothing left. I'm just going to show you. Oh, I, I got this all out of order. Let's see. <laughs> well, no wonder I'm on slide seven. Let's see. Let's go back up to the top. Here's how it looked at the time of his death in 1926. He was a man who lived very humbly. For the last 10 or 20 years of his life, this was all he was doing. He dedicated his life entirely to this church and to the church in general. He was a very devout Catholic. He, was this uh, the local canonization? Anyway? I haven't heard that it was kiboshed. I mean, he, there is a group that is working for his beatification. Um, he, he was struck by a trolley and in, near the church site, and nobody knew who he was because he was such a humble man. And, uh, and then, uh, you know, at the time they, fear, they realized this was the great dark architect, Antonio Gaudí, who was at death's door, and he died from that. Um, he, he said, uh, oh yes, I love this quote from him. He said, work on the Sagrada Familia proceeds slowly because the boss, the padron, is not in a hurry, meaning God. 
<laughs> he was he knew that it was going to take a long time to finish and in fact it's still unfinished today you said you just saw it isn't it still unfinished it's still unfinished yeah well, I, in spain they say it's going to be 20 30 40 they, they don't know they know it's going to take another generation right okay. um it has three main facades this much i can tell you about it that he planned three different facades one of which is the one you're seeing here on the right uh, was the furthest finished when he died. This is the facade of the nativity. Another scene is uh, uh, another side is the facade of the f passion, which has been significantly worked on and completed by a completely different sculptor uh, since his death. And then there's the facade of the Gloria, and I'm not sure because I haven't been able to see very many photographs. I think that's the least completed. Each one of these facades has these four huge spires around it. Let's just see some more pictures here. Oh, I need to take it with it and get it in another mode here, don't I? There you go. There's an aerial view of it. It's one of the facades. This may be the facade of the Gloria. There are he liked to put words like Sancta Sancta Sanctus right into the side of the church as part of the a uh, part of the ornamentation. Each of the facades was to have four spires, and then there was a great cupola dedicated to the Virgin that would be in the center. Uh, after he died, the anarchists during the Spanish Civil War sacked his studio and burned all his models. So it can be very difficult to start, try to, it took a long time to kind of try to reconstruct it uh, and try to build from that. Now, this was his own idea that the, the facade of the nativity was birth, incarnation, power, father. The facade of the passion was evangelization, crucifixion, wisdom, and son. You see the trinity in its different manifestations. And then the facade of the glory was passion, resurrection, infinite love, and the paraclete. These are details from the facade of the nativity. Now, you can see as you look at it, it has kind of organic quality to it. And he said that nature was his great teacher. What I find very fascinating about Gaudi, and of course this is not the only way to build churches, but it is a very interesting way, is that he took tradition, like the Gothic tradition, the Gothic churches, and he made it into a living thing. He didn't just take it as some kind of something dead he ended up from others. He used new materials. He used reinforced concrete and ceramics. Why did he use ceramics? So unlike, for example, the National Shrine of the Immaculate Conception in Washington, D.C., a building I consider to be a failure architecturally. Anybody want to fight about that? I think it's a failure. He, he, that, that, to me, is a, is a building that's dead because they just tried to build in a totally traditional, just, it's traditionalistic. Okay? He took these traditions and tried to make them into something really alive. Of course, some people think that this is very overdone. <laughs> you know what led to its being dedicated to the Holy Family? Oh, thank you for asking that question. Well, uh, as I was trying to show today, this the, the devotion to the Holy Family grew and grew over time, especially with in Spain, Saint Joseph became such an important saint. Saint Joseph was the patron saint of Mexico, many other Latin American countries that were Spanish as the patron saint of. Canada. So this, this love of St. Joseph, I think, grew into an appreciation of the Holy Family. Uh, and he was a member of the Society of St. Joseph, which had inaugurated this, this Holy Family. You can't think of any medieval cathedral that's dedicated to the Holy Family. Right? It's just, it's, this is a relatively new, and I don't know when the Feast of the Holy Family was inaugurated in the church. Does anybody know when that began? But it's, it's, these are not really, really old things as, as far as the church goes. This, I think, is quite beautiful, close-up of the nativity scene. Now, this is the passion facade, which was all done after, he was de uh, after his death. And you'll see the sculptor who worked here had a somewhat cubistic style. So the rest of the That's all right. I Although I am very impressed with this. <laughs> I'm very impressed with that. It, you know, yeah, Veronica's veiled it. He, Gaudi talked about the fact that it would change after he died. <clears throat> He said that, that was okay with him because that was the way a lot of cathedrals, they would, they would evolve and change, and he knew that there would be certain changes in the style. Whether he would have liked this, I don't know. But 
This is some of the, okay, now here's some of the things. There's a quote from him. The idea of the, the Bible of nature and the Bible of scripture, which is an old idea in Christianity. Okay, now I just have to show you these things. He used, his construction principle were based on hyperbolic curves and parabolas. And he said that they would be stronger and better acoustically than forms that had been used before this. And I think he was really onto something. <laughs> because he was using spaces, kinds of geometry, uh, futuristic kinds of geometry, but still remaining with this kind of idiom. You look at it and you think, you can think of Gothic cathedrals. Here's some close-ups of all these wild things. <laughs> the inside of the cathedral is meant to look like trees going up, you know, like the like uh, organic. Anyway, just some details of it. And that's it. The Holy Family. So, I wanted to introduce you to Gaudi. I think that this is a um, a direction. Uh, the, uh, I don't know if you've ever read the book uh, Ugly as Sin by Michael Rose. Are you familiar with that? How, how churches were turned into these worship spaces <laughs> and how you can turn it around. And he says that uh, there are three things that you need to have a beautiful church. Verticality, permanence, and iconography. Okay, but that, uh, that, that I think you do need those three things, but it's not enough. What, what Gaudí shows one path toward, which is, I think, for the era in which we live, he has personality. And I do not think in the 20th or the 21st century that we can build churches that, that lack a sense of the, of the human person in them, that can be just cold, uh, remote buildings. And so he might have bent the twig a little too far in one way, but mm -hmm. his... Buildings really definitely have that sense of a, of a vibrant individual person, of a, 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 a human being. And, and we, we, we're often left today in church architecture with what seemed to be the, we, we either have a kind of very cold, ultra-modernistic style, or we have something which is simply the copying of a Gothic or some other tradition from the past, but which has no life to it. So... Um, I'd be happy. <laughs> if I haven't totally worn you out, I'll take any questions that you might have at this point. Thank you can turn the lights on. <laughs>